Zero MK session. Um, uh, I'm uh, I'm Lawrence, and uh, I'm going to present to you a different way of kind of looking at um, networks, board layer for um, for infrastructure. So why this talk today? So there's a bunch of um, we can't look at software as a black box these days anymore. There's a bunch of uh, mobile you know, it runs on mobile phones, um, Blackberries, laptops, data centers, etc. So it's really important that governments can uh, communicate in a seamless manner. The background is in operations and uh, and uh, flat entity in Estonia called Bare Metal. And the way that communication flows into different departments and also not in most cases. Um, credentials uh, with ZeroMQ, I added monitoring support to the project. I'm a CZMQ co-maintainer. I wrote a Ruby binding for it as well. And at the moment, I'm working on a security layer um, for the project as well, which is kind of work in progress. Um, so just a quick note, many people coming to this particular project are always kind of confused with the message queue part. Um, so 99% of deployments don't need enterprise reliability. So I've done some work in, in financial industry and banks before as well. And whatever you see in your account, in your trading account, it's never really what you have there. There's always some sort of reconciliation we know at the end of every um, trading day, for example. So you know, back then, if you look at 30, 40 years ago, there's like a huge operations team. You always had only like maybe two uh, businesses that I had to integrate, and it was really expensive to maintain this communication as well. And these days, you get you know one guy that's really good as chef. He can manage thousands of nodes as well. And if we if we want to the whole point of startups as well, we want to integrate. We want to have APIs. You want to share information. Um, we want to we want to produce. Use information, consume information as well. So it's really um, important to have open communication infrastructure as well. So what is a broker? There's no nothing administered. There's no central um, entity where messages go through. It's really simple to start learning, integrating the application as well. And of course, it's free latency. So it was built with the financial service industry as as a success. Um, so it's designed for extreme uh, performance. It's definitely, it's not. It's not. It, like I said, it's not a message queue. It's not a broker. Um, and this is kind of confuses people um, right off the bat as well. So a different way to look at this applications server, not a, not a message queue, but it's something that you can link into your application library. Um, but mostly for communication as, as well as for concurrency as well. It solves those two problems um, very well. And another way to look at well, you standard BSD sockets with messaging semantics um, on top of them as well. So we all mostly familiar with, I mean, in a real-time conference, so we all have done work with networks, etc. So simple BSD API, um, we bind, we connect, we send, receive, and close. So it's those like um, main operations that we always be working with, and. Uh, from a community perspective, so there's a sm really small core that maintain it, and it's a huge um, community around. It. So um, all this particular API that, that I uh, showed you earlier, so that's exposed through different languages, at the moment, the plus different bindings. Um, so most of the this thing is zero MQ um, binding that you can use. So you can just you know different applications, different languages talking to to each other in a, in a seamless way. Um, and also, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Goldman Sachs situation with the programmer being arrested. Like, author of the airline binding, for example. Um, so, so what is a zero MQ socket? So um, I also like to look at it as kind of it's a scriptable socket. So it's easy for us to, as business um, requirements change, we can refactor code pretty more difficult to do that with communications as well. So usually what happens is like department would change over time, the software that, that um, the drives that department change over time as well, but then also how that department communicates with another one changes also. So if, if the communication stays static, but the, the actual um, implementation changes, then we have a situation where you usually have like um, communication problems, there will be brittle integration points, performance issues, etc. Um, so one of the reasons um, why ZeroMQ is really good for these things is we can bind and connect to, to multiple endpoints simultaneously, which is something that's much more difficult to do with um, with standard sockets, we can also do asynchronous connect and bind. So you can connect and bind in any order. So imagine that you have a client that you can bring up before servers up and running. 
And this is something that people overlook really, um, really easily. Also, is it, it, you know you can build new systems, but the most important is always the system that's running right now that's generating you money. So any changes that you can make to that system in a way that you don't need to orchestrate a huge rollout plan or, or stuff like that, um, especially with figuring out which clients to bring down, which service to bring up first. Um, it's really, really good for availability and, and keeping business up and running as well. So I'm going to focus on these three different communication patterns or like kind of socket pairs. Um, so mapping this to what happens usually within a business. A request reply could be like, I want to know something from you and expect an answer right away. So it's kind of RPC. We're all familiar with this client server. The second one is information distribution. So um, stuff that I want everyone to know. I don't care about responses. And then the third one is that of work delegation or like push and pull topology, which is um, basically just to farm out work to other people. So it happens for managers uh, down this way. So request reply, uh, a couple of interesting things here. So it's the only communication pattern that's lockstep. So if you have a client or server, you always need to to like, you know, I'm asking you something, I'm expecting uh, an answer back. And then from a request perspective, so if I have a client socket and I want to, you know, a, a service that I built with reply sockets, I can have connection to four of them. So I have load balancing down to the client. So automatically, just because I connected four times, I, I now have um, four times the amount of a potential availability that I would have if I just used a normal TCP socket. Uh, likewise with the reply socket also. So usually we need to worry about things like multiplex I/O, etc. Um, so zero MQ basically just does the right thing. It figures out if you're on a, for example, Linux, it will pick um, KQ, no KQ, EPOL, sorry. Um, and then you have like an instant, uh, you know, scalable server uh, up and running there. It can handle tens of thousands of connections. Um, so as I mentioned, basic use cases, flow control, orchestration, etc. So anything you can use for um, uh, rep pair. Publish, subscribe, a bit different, all familiar with it. It's really simple to understand. So if you want to distribute, for example, build mobile games, you want to distribute game state to a bunch of different players. Um, likewise, we just want to push information. And so as I mentioned, it's, it had its roots in, in the financial services industry. So it's fast enough to, to uh, to, to be a data fabric between a, um, different data stores as well. So you can actually use it for application. I think at NASA they have a, a very big cluster where they just use, that, use it for data um, processing and moving like a huge amount of data around as well. So we can also invert this pattern. We can, we can say, well, imagine we have a bunch of processes, a bunch of backends in your system, um, and they will all just have a pub socket, and we have a central logging location, like a sub socket. So what the guys have done as well is they added a module to our syslog, um, a zero MQ uh, input output module. So this is really interesting now. If your whole stack is logging through this, you, if you're interested in just getting log streams for like a minute or two minutes, you just fire up a new subscriber socket, subscribe to your infrastructure, or subset thereof, get a live feed of uh, log information, and just disconnect and you know off you go without having to to do um, anything else. So uh, interesting to note here is in earlier releases of zero MQ, the pub socket um, usually just distribute a data on your subscriber did all the filtering. So it's kind of not an ideal use case if you have um, like a very busy network as well. So basically then like everything just basically got sent down, whereas in later releases, the pub sock is always filtering. So you don't get a lot of flooding on your network as well because the publisher will figure out like, um, yeah, you know, the right thing to do. It's work distribution. So if you have any message coming back down from the push socket up here, We'll get you know any one of these that happen to be idle that's not doing anything right now. We'll we'll take the work. Um, so these are really good. They're really extendable as well. So you can just have multiple layers of that. It's kind of like Unix um, pipes, and it's really good for variable task processing. So if you have things like media transcoding, um, video processing, etc., you could just keep um, keep adding workers to that tier as well, and it'll be scalable to whatever multiplexer you happen to be using. So that could be ten thousand workers on a from a central uh, Linux box as well. Um, so transports, and this is something that's really interesting. So there's like three different ones, and there's a, I guess a couple of other ones. So there's a WebSocket one in development at the moment as well. So in process, so imagine we have a simple business requirement. We need to build like a pub sub system, and we want to do it really cheap. We just want to evaluate it like on a machine and the aim of moving it to production later. So uh, simple network, one publisher, three subscribers. So the cheapest way of doing this is just having a single process boundary. So we have four threads, main thread, and three threads, 
we create a pub socket in the main thread and subscriber sockets in our worker threads, and we use the in-process transport for it. So we just create an endpoint, uh, connect a bunch of sockets together, and then we have like an application. Very simple to evaluate, simple to test. Later on, we see, okay, so you know this is really valuable for the business. We want to deploy it somewhere else as well. So now we can move it to different processes. So each of these sockets become a process. They get deployed on a, on a, on, a, on the same box. So we use an IPC or inter-process transport. So right now we've, we've been able to scale up without really changing anything. And then later on, if we know that that's actually really, really taking off, we move now onto the network. We just swap out the transport, TCP. And at this point, you can go web scale. You can just you know, keep adding boxes on the network, and, and off you go. And all with a uniform API. Nothing changes. You still send, receive, bind, connect, and close. And then you just swap out the transport. So uh, so it's all good and well being able to build up simple net, but it's really simple to add complexity and just build things that, that become a mess really quickly as well. So one way to do this is with devices. So we're all familiar with network switches. Um, so a simple device, you imagine add a network, a publisher, two subscribers. And now there's a business requirement that I need to do logging, or you need to log everything that's being sent from the publisher down to the subscribers. So the simplest way to do this, and also note that the business requirement is we cannot change the publisher, we cannot change the subscribers. We can only add something uh, intermediate. So what we do there is we add a device. So it's a simple input socket, output socket. So we just um, so we add a subscriber socket that that uh, interconnects that publisher to these two subscribers, and we have a persistence device. The way this will look in code really simple. We have a main loop. We receive on a pub socket on our sub socket. We we do whatever we need to do with that message in whatever way we need to persist it, and. We just resend it back to the subscribers. So the publisher is not aware of it, and the, sub the subscribers are not aware of it either. But we still meet the business requirement. Later on, if we need to remove it, we remove the device, and you know everything's back to normal. So use cases typically for these devices is being able to proxy between different network segments. You can do you know, deduping. Um, if you have like a, a really um, high traffic data stream, if you want to information before it hits your subscribers as well. So an example of um, again coming back to work distribution. So imagine, like up here in the top, a ventilator or a socket. So you can be a node application given a real-time conf. I think that's going to be a pretty big um, node theme here. So uh, a push socket that's just it gets events for something from a client, and we need to process those events or do stuff with it as well. So in the middle here, we have a, a worker tier, which is just simple pull push devices. So the only thing they could be doing anything. Some could be, be persisting. Some could be doing other stuff as well. And in the end, right in the bottom, we're connecting um, the results in a in a in a uh, message sync. Now, remember that I that I mentioned that any of these can be in any language, right? So it's it's a like language agnostic library. So there's a bunch of uh, bindings available. So you can have no, you can you could collect the results in Erlang. Um, if we notice that this is becoming really popular, so imagine you're adding more infrastructure on the node end as well. So we just keep adding push sockets. We connect these devices back onto the second one as well, and right now we have a ventilator scalable. Our, we can do the same on the on the result side as well. So and we can just keep growing out this tier. So we now have an infinite scalable system that you can do in any language. You can keep adding stuff and keep removing stuff. Um, so that's kind of like an example of of the power that you have being able to restructure things. Really simple. And a, a single rule here to adhere to is we call the interjection principle, which means that um, Anything that you add in your network topology should never change the results and should never interfere with uh, with your edges. Um, so an example of saving bandwidth, like in a massive multiplayer online game. So imagine we have four players. All of these players are in a subscribe have a subsocket. So these are your clients. And if we notice that those two are in different geographic regions, and these ones are like based in the same like state boundary or city or whatever. So what we do here is then we can add a device on the edge of that network sub and pub device. So what this will happen basically then is notice that the bandwidth going out from the top only hits this device over here. So we wound up saving bandwidth on a wide area network and just redistribute that on a, lo on a local area network as well. So that's a, an effort that you know, pe folks played around with called the scalability protocol with the goal of that was to add this kind of features into a Linux kernel, which means it would be deployable on, on routers and boxes and servers, etc. Uh, just a couple of things. So it's it's all good and well to be able to to build systems. We build flexible systems, but it's it's not good if we can't make changes to them, or these systems aren't um, highly available anyway as well. 
Um, so a couple of guarantees. Um, so the messages that you send back and forth, so we all work with buffers. You need to um, receive, send, receive, etc. So it's always one of those things where which is not really comfortable to work with. So messaging just makes it really simple. So if I've got like, a message can be anything. So if I want to send you a movie, as long as there's memory and processing power available to, uh, to send this on, on my client and you've got memory on the receiver as well, if I want to send you a five gig movie clip as a message, then that's all game, as long as there's bandwidth and memory on either end uh, to be able to do that. So you don't think about it. You get the, the, the other side gets the whole movie or nothing, and that's it. So this makes it really simple, just being able to think um, like that and, and without having to do like a lot of buffer management, etc. Uh, the second one is availability as well. So uh, one of the big things here is unordered uh, bind and connect, which allows us to make changes to a running system. It's really good for uh, service-oriented architecture, etc. And ultimately, reliability is basically it's best implemented as Batten. So just because you'll be running Postgres in, in your stack doesn't mean you have a highly available, a highly available system, right? So it's, it's a combination of different things. And there's basically a bunch of uh, interesting things published in the ZeroMQ guide, which you can find at zguide.zeromq.org, which has a bunch of patterns for different requirements. So queue systems, persistence, and the binary star pattern for high availability. Um, so my point here being that it's a, it's a collection of, of, of things and not just one component that'll, that'll make it a good system. So just a quick um, example of how we can use ZeroMQ for, for concurrency within the same process. Um, so we have here like four threads. We have a main thread with a push socket and we have three different threads with a pull socket each. So and then they communicate with, it, with each other uh, through an I.O. thread, so, which is hidden from us. We don't care about that. It's lo local to, to the ZeroMQ framework. So notice that, again, yeah, like one, one socket in the main thread and three in, in worker threads. So our, our master implementation would look something like this. So we create the push socket. We, we map it to a transport, in-process transport, endpoint called W. We spawn three worker threads, and we have a main loop. So notice that there's no mutexes here, yeah? No locking, no mutexes, no nothing. And a worker thread example would we connect back to the same in-process transport. We have a main loop as well. We receive message. We do stuff with it, and again, there's no mutexes. So if we, wanna, if we have an 8-core box or 16-core box, and we want to just add capacity to this particular implementation, then we just keep adding worker threads, and they will just distribute just work from the master down to the, down to the workers. And we're not doing locking, we're not doing anything. We don't care about the usual uh, things of multi-threading as long as each socket just lives in its own thread. Uh, so another simple case study. Um, who's familiar with a Mongrel 2 web server? All right, not too, many, not too many. So this is a really good example of using ZeroMQ um, as a transport layer for, for a project. So it's basically it's a multi-protocol HTTP server, so it speaks... Uh, Flash XML it understands a bunch of JSON things as well. And it uses ZeroMQ for backends. So what he wanted to do here is he wanted to write a really thin HTTP, a really thin, reliable, secure HTTP server. He didn't want to care about communication with the backends, or he didn't want to implement that layer. So what he opted for is he implemented, he supported ZeroMQ. So that exposes um, like the server to um, a whole platform of we have the community with a different binding. So now this web server is compatible to 30 different languages out the box, just with a simple contract. So the way this works at a really high level is we've basically got like a couple of different devices. So um, a client would be somewhere in a web browser, and then we'll have a, a push and sub device, which is basically a Mongol 2 web server. And each of the backends is just a pull and pub device, right? So any of these backends, again, it can be in any language as long as it just implements a simple wire protocol. It looks something like this. So the global unique ID for the Mongol2 instance, an ID for the browser, client, a URI path, and then a simple uh, a protocol for headers and uh, HTTP headers and HTTP body. So a request will look something like this. So we've got AB23 as a Mongol2 instance, uh, browser ID number four, URI pushes the headers and the body down, uh, and then the push and pull. Um, combination and then we just you know the client does whatever it, what the backend does whatever it needs to do with that uh, particular request sends back the response um, and it goes back back to Mongol 2 which knows from having ID 4 which browser that response needs to go to so 
Yeah, I guess like we're at the end here. Um, so I just want to note something else as well before coming to questions. Uh, well, maybe questions first. Um, anything? No time for questions. Okay. So uh, something else. So uh, there's a book. If there's any more information either about this, there's a book that's being published by O'Reilly right now called um, Zero MQ, and I want to call out <laughs> I want to call out the the author of that book, Peter, which is up next. So I think he's going to do something with this uh, later on. Thank you. <laughs>